Okay. Um, so there are, or es sind schon Fragen da aus dem, po, aus dem Plenum. Normalerweise war vorgesehen, dass das Podium noch mal reagieren kann. Nein, wir nehmen die Fragen, wie sie da sind. Oh, die Leute, die sie zusammengetragen haben, können sie am besten auch vorlesen. Die sind schon vertraut damit. Sorry for the confusion. So I read all four of them out loud and I pass them on to you. So you have them written and they're all in English. How to give degrowth more influence, especially in respect to the big antagonistic power of economic, criminal and military organizations and the fossil fuel industry, not to forget. What challenges and risks you think will occur when the degrowth movements will transform society? Is there, for example, the risk of new elites, ideologies or social conflicts? Degrowth seems to be a movement mainly rooted in and centered on early industrialized, industrialized countries such as Central Western Europe or North America. How can it become a global movement that involves less industrialized countries as well? Or do they depend on growth? Where do you see degrowth in 10 years? And the last one, which I haven't read. What are first steps on combining or connecting different important movements like attack, we are the 99%, grassroots movements, transition, indigenous people movements, Because capitalism divides these movements. Thank you for your questions. So, a first cluster of six, actually, questions, not addressed to someone specific. I would guess you all want to say something. So, who likes to start? <laughs> Any first mover? Okay. Ich habe jetzt zu diesen spezifischen, auf die, die Growth-Bewegung bezogenen Fragen eigentlich nichts zu sagen, ähm, außer vielleicht einer Sache, die wir eben alle teilen. Wenn wir mehr Einfluss haben wollen, dann müssen wir sehr viel kreativer sein in unserem Vokabular. Die Growth, glaube ich, funktioniert nicht gut. Commons, glaube ich, funktioniert auch nicht wirklich gut. Ähm, und es braucht sozusagen so eine Art Allianz mit den ganzen kreativen Köpfen und Designern und Künstlern und Poeten dieser Welt. So I think I can say something on um, on question three and five. <laughs> so question three is the one on if I got it well. Um, well, is it is the growth only about industrialized countries? What about so-called developing countries? Do they need growth? And number five is uh, the issue of alliances among different movements. So.
I think here there is an issue that the growth clearly was born in Western industrialized countries and to them initially applied and all the debate has been about them. So the debate on the growth in the South, I think, is somehow incipient. But there are a few things that we should, not, uh, we should be very careful about. Somebody would say that um, northern countries like Europe need to degrow for the, so for the South to grow. I think that is very dangerous. Um, but the other risk that we should also avoid is to think of degrowth as a new model, as a new general model or concept such as development that we could apply everywhere in the context. Somebody today in a small discussion group we had uh, said, you know, in India it would not sound well the growth. Well, the issue is that we will not export the growth to other countries. And often I also say, even when we say that the growth is for Europe or for Germany, the situation within Germany is much more differentiating than that. So we should be very careful with that. And the issue is that we should better think of what we could call some kind of cross-cultural exchange among different perspectives, such as, for instance, the ones we know, the growth and Buen Vivir, but we could mention more like Ubuntu in South Africa or radical ecological democracy in India, or if we go back in the history of India, the economy of permanence developed by the Gandhian economist Kumar Rapa. So, of course, we need an exchange among all these different perspectives, and we should approach them, as Alberto would say, with modesty, try to understand which are the commonalities and which are the differences also because there are cultural issues, there is an historical, social, and economic context which is different. So for each of these, we, we would need something different. So I like the expression of uh, Alberto, of when we be in plural. So this is on the first two questions. Then if I can say something more on another question, on the issue of, which is a difficult question, number one, on how can we make the growth more influential against, for instance, the so-called military industrial uh, complex. And here also I relate to some of the questions by the speakers, I think, uh, from Nicola. And it regards a little bit the strategy. So how are we going to do it? That's, uh, that's often the question. What has to be done? Somebody else would have said. Uh, so I think in the debate of the growth, of course, there is an attention that there are uh, multiple strategies and that there, <clears throat> even though some conflicts exist, but more or less they are compatible, we have argued also in other um, events. And I could mention some of them. One is, of course, grassroots experiences, so kind of alternatives that we know, and the actors would be the practitioners, people doing practical stuff, like when we grow <coughs> um, organic olive uh, trees. But, of course, academia is also important because it provides narratives and discourses. Uh, so-called oppositional activism, like the environmental justice movement, building against mega and useless projects is also important. And we could also think of how we want to influence political parties or trade unions. So, of course, within the degrowth movement, I think it would be very difficult to say that we have one correct strategy for everything. But there is for sure a combination, uh, multiplicity of strategies, and we should investigate them and we should think of them and think also of how we can combine them all together. For sure we need a larger political project, um, but we should keep this in mind, the multiplicity of strategy. Thank, Thank you. you. Good. Um, um, I'd like to reinforce um, this last point about the multiplicity of, of strategies. I think that's uh, extremely important that there are different starting points, different perspectives, um, contexts, histories, cultures, everything, I mean everything we do is, is embedded in some story from the past. So I think that we're not, we're not starting from from nowhere, but we, we bring with us a lot of different um, realities and experiences. Um, but at the same time, I think that um, the, the, the objective of trying to work together to build alliances, to enlarge the movement, is absolutely fundamental. And we shouldn't stay on our own tracks of, of, of differences and, and different strategies. Um, and in my, my own experience, um, the best way to do things is by doing things together. 
Um, you know, it's not it's not a theoretical thing, but it's actually you know we we work out how to to talk to each other, to build common language, to to build shared perspectives um, by doing things together, by organising demos, by organising conferences, by planning campaigns, by building networks, by having academic seminars where we discuss, um, you know, different perspectives and different theories. I think all of these things are, are valid, but we do it in the practice. It's not, it's, not in, it's not in theory. And so it's by expressing solidarity with other people's struggles, um, turning up, uh, you know, for the uh, uh, blockade of, of the coal mines in Western Germany, or uh, helping to shut down some big useless project, or supporting the people in Notre Dame de Londe who are trying to stop the airport, by supporting the um, the people in Ecuador who are who are pushing to keep the oil in the soil. I mean, all of these things. I think we we have to work in solidarity and to support each other's struggles. Um, and just just to finish, I support very much Zilka's point about language. Um, I think. Degrowth is somewhat an unfortunate word, and it would be good to, I mean, I, you know, but, okay, degrowth is a word that doesn't really thrill me, but at the same time, if I read this, what does degrowth mean to us, I agree with absolutely everything that's there. You know, it could be a statement coming from the climate justice movement. It's such a, it's such a, it's such a um, deep perspective, and I, I think that you know that, that language is often a bit of an obstacle to people finding ways of working together. Um, but I mean, it's only words after all. So I think that we can we can eventually overcome that. Um, and maybe it, sound, it, it does sound a little bit better in French, of course. Des croissants, you know, it's a little bit... It's like two croissants, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ¿Qué representa el decrecimiento para los países subdesarrollados? A primera vista, Los países subdesarrollados tendrían todavía que crecer. Pero la experiencia. la reedición caricaturizada de lo que se ha hecho en el norte, porque eso es insostenible. En la actualidad, el 20% más rico de la población mundial consume el 80% de los recursos de la tierra. Y eso ya implica una presión sobre la tierra de 1.5 veces su capacidad de absorción. Si el otro 80% que no está consumiendo tanto y que tiene el derecho a consumir, consumiera igual que el 20% más rico, habría una presión adicional sobre la tierra de seis veces más. Eso es insostenible para todos. Por eso es fundamental la redistribución de la riqueza dentro de los países y entre los países. Un tema clave que podríamos discutir es el de la deuda ecológica y el de la deuda histórica, en la cual los países ricos son los acreedores. Y eso también es un tema para construir una sociedad al margen del crecimiento económico. El tema del buen vivir, por supuesto, nos podría ayudar, o de los buenos convivires, a pensar otras formas de organizar la economía, la sociedad y la política. Un segundo punto que quisiera abordar muy rápidamente, porque ya creo que todos estamos en la hora para ir a tomar una cerveza o dos, ¿ya? es el que si va a haber o no conflictos sociales. Sí va a haber conflictos sociales. Si no nos podemos imaginar un mundo milenarista, donde nos vamos a pasar todos cantando en las calles y bailando, va a haber problemas, pero hay que tratar de evitar que haya muchos problemas por la forma en que está organizada la sociedad y la economía. Miren ustedes, a cuenta de ser eficientes, demandamos cada vez más productos y consumimos cosas que a la larga no necesitamos. Leí el otro día en un estudio realizado en los Estados Unidos que el tiempo de uso 
de un taladro, de una bor machine. En los, en los Estados Unidos, el tiempo de uso que tiene la bor machine en una household, en una casa, es de 18 minutos al año. Tenemos que desarmar entonces esas lógicas de la eficiencia y establecer los criterios de la suficiencia para vivir dignamente todos, porque eso es una tarea clave. Segundo punto importante, la idea de la acumulación permanente de bienes materiales y sobre todo a título individual. Eso tiene que ser sustituido por una visión de la reciprocidad. La competencia permanente de todos los seres humanos tiene que ser reemplazada por la solidaridad. Por eso hablamos de buen vivir, de las armonías. La vida en armonía del ser humano consigo mismo, del ser humano con los otros seres humanos y de individuos y comunidades viviendo en armonía con la naturaleza. Es preferible orientarnos por esas ideas que por las ideas dominantes del capitalismo. Acumulación, competencia interminable y la eficiencia que está terminando por matar al mundo. Me parece que esas son algunas de las ideas. Y como economista, un tema clave y fundamental. No solo hay que resolver los problemas locales, sino los problemas globales. Y ahí podemos unirnos con otros procesos, como el grupo de ATAC. Hay que impulsar el impuesto Tobin y hacer una realidad de ese impuesto para agravar las transacciones especulativas, las transacciones financieras internacionales. ¿Cuándo acabamos con los paraísos fiscales? Que es un problema que genera corrupción y genera una enorme tensión y es causa de conflictos sociales. ¿Cuándo damos una respuesta justa y digna al tema de la deuda externa? Los países del sur de América, de América del Sur y otra vez de Argentina, sufrimos grandes problemas con el tema de la deuda externa y ahora están sufriendo los mismos problemas los países del sur de Europa Italia, Portugal, España Grecia, Irlanda puede que haya problemas generados por sus propios gobiernos pero ¿por qué no les damos una solución? pregunta para los alemanes y las alemanas ¿por qué no le dan una solución como la que recibió Alemania el 27 de febrero de 1953 con el Acuerdo de Londres cuando se terminó la Segunda Guerra Mundial. Ahí hay respuestas claras y concretas para dar respuestas a los problemas. Y concluyo con algo que me parece clave. En el mundo en el que quiero vi que vivan mis nietos y mis nietas no debería haber armas. El tema de las armas no puede ser una industria para que se enriquezcan pocos. Deberíamos imaginarnos en un mundo donde la gente no tenga que ir a la guerra. Ese debería ser al menos un motivo para seguir luchando y para seguir creyendo que otro mundo es posible y deseable. Muchas gracias. There's three more questions. More um, in case you recognize your question, but you had written it in English, we translated them. So they're all in English up here. The first. Nation state, government, elites. What should be our strategy dealing with them? What can we leave in their hands and what not? How can we organize the transformation in a situation in which most people agree with the established system and benefit from the capitalist institutions? People don't like change and complexity, so how do we sell the idea of degrowth and commoning? And the last one. What has degrowth to do with freedom? What do you say to critics who identify growth with freedom? Okay, so three, four actually final questions. Uh, and this is the last round. You may like to say what you did manage to say so far. So it is our last round. Anyone extremely keen to start this time? <laughs> Come on. I can say something. Keep closer. Switch off the microphone. There's an issue about dinner after. And no, but. So let me say. 
something which is, I have to admit, not linked with these questions, but with the previous debate. But that is what I had prepared. But it's a little bit on the issue of um, degrowth as a name, no? It doesn't sound very good and all. So I would say that uh, as the word degrow emerged as a slogan, of course it was to provoke. So the French intellectual Polar Yes used to say that it is a mobu, meaning a, a missile word, no? A stone that you throw into the debate to debunk or somehow to try and destroy or challenge the hegemony of grow. So, of course, if you need a provocative slogan, well, you cannot uh, pretend that it will also sound nice. And I think that we should admit that up to now it has been quite successful. Um, we are 3,000 here, so somehow we should, we should say that, that it was important. And the second issue, which is important also which having, uh, with having a name which doesn't sound very well, is that it helps much with the issue of cooptation. So, of course, uh, the issue of green or sustainable or susta what does sustainability mean today? Nothing. So, there is a risk with names that they get very easily co-opted we could say easily by capitalism. And that is also the case, I think, if I can say with modesty, with Ben Vivir. So that is being retaken also by United Nations because it sounds pretty nice. So that's the problem that we should um, challenge. That doesn't mean also that we necessarily need to stick with the growth, with the name the growth. That's not the point. That's not the important thing. What is important is that the, the debate that we have developed and the, the other words, the other entries that, for instance, you can find in the book, in the, in the um, degrowth vocabulary, that we have been discussing so that we can get to a common language for discussing. And we could go back to a very ambitious project that, if you want, we could try and attempt to retake from the Situationist, uh, which are also part, as Marbara Muraka uh, teaches us, of the roots of degrowth. The and they had a project, among many other people like Guy Debord, of rewriting completely the vocabulary, but not just 50 words, but the completely new dictionary. All the words we use have been taken and have been <clears throat> somehow co-opted by the hegemony. So we could think of rewriting completely uh, the vocabulary. But maybe we could try and push the growth as a word, that's one option, and make it something acceptable that sounds nice. And I think, for instance, of the word queer, if I'm not mistaken from the feminist movement, that's also the operation that they, they took. A word which was used some hours in Ingsal, they, to, they tried to take it back. And that is this also to do with, um, with power. And if I can make it, I was a bit long, but... Yeah. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> After. Sorry. I, you can have my time. Huh? Oh, I mean, I can just make a short comment on the issue. Everybody agrees. <laughs> Everybody agrees with the current system, nobody wants to change. I think that's, um, I understand that feeling. I do feel it uh, a lot of time, but for sure not when I'm at these conferences. But I can, so, I can also say that there are moments of rapture. For instance, when the crisis started in 2008, the growth got a lot of attention. And I can say also that when the Indignados movement, what in English you would call the Occupy movement, started in Spain, suddenly we were lots of people in the square in a big assembly, and the assembly, I can tell you, was much bigger than this one. So we did not expect it, and not all of them were so from social movements, but were, they were normal people. And you can see also other signs <laughs> of not subnormal or like we are. And you can see also other signs, for instance, if you look at the um, uh, par parliamentary politics, we say, standard politics in Spain, the issue of Podemos, new party raising, and you can see lots of these phenomena, not only in Europe, but I've seen them, for instance, in India. So challenging mainstream political parties, the idea of having only two parties and all. So I think that sometimes we have signs that not everybody agrees, but we have to come and speak out, and people, I think, will join. I don't know how many, but more people of the ones we are here. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. <laughs>
Und ähm, ich finde, das hat auch einen sehr praktischen Aspekt. Wenn die Leute mich immer fragen, wenn ich einen Vortrag halte, ich, aber womit soll ich denn mein Geld verdienen? Dann sage ich gewöhnlich, man kann ja die Frage auch mal rumdrehen und sagen, wie viele Möglichkeiten habe ich denn, mein Leben so zu gestalten, dass ich weniger Geld verdienen muss. Und dann kann man anfangen, all diese Möglichkeiten sozusagen anzuschauen, überhaupt dahin zu schauen. Und um das einfacher zu machen, haben sich so um die 50 Leute in Deutschland und Österreich was ganz Besonderes ausgedacht. Also Karl Zeiss Jena hat ja den Slogan, das ist jetzt keine Schleichwerbung, sondern nur eine Überleitung, ich komme von dort, wir machen es sichtbar, we make it visible. Und da haben wir uns jetzt ein Beispiel dran genommen und es gibt unheimlich viele Mapping-Projekte und jetzt stellen Sie sich vor, in Ihrem Viertel oder in Ihrem Dorf oder in Ihrer Stadt, da sieht man auf einer Karte, auf einer freien Karte und nicht auf Google, all diese Initiativen, die Degrowth-Initiativen, die Urban Gardens, die freien Werkstätten, die alle, alle, alle Commons-Projekte, die sich dort finden, alle Transition Towns zusammen, jede kleine Energieinitiative, die uns helfen kann, unser Leben Geld unabhängiger zu gestalten. Und das machen wir sichtbar auf einer Karte. Morgen ist der Launch von Transform Map, wo wir es schaffen wollen, alle Informationen so zusammenzubringen, dass es wirklich leicht ist, anders zu leben, so leicht wie im Supermarkt einkaufen zu gehen. Und was ich von dieser Konferenz erwarte, ist, dass Transform Map so, sozusagen global wird und ein internationales Projekt, das uns einfach sozusagen durch das gemeinsame Tun an dieser Karte zusammenbringt. Danke sehr. Me va a tocar hablar rápidamente de cuál es el papel del gobierno o del Estado. Ja, ganz herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much to the podium, to the people here. Oh, Nicola, do you want to? No, no, no. She has taken her time. Uh, she, 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 has, she has devoted her time. Um, I thank you very much for your inspiring uh, talks in the beginning. Ich danke euch und